Hi, and welcome to Coffee and Calacas. I'm your host, Joe. If you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you and just let you know that this is a weekly podcast where we sit around the coffee table, drink coffee, and talk about stories of mysticism, the supernatural, and what else lies in the beyond. If this is something that interests you, please stick around and enjoy this week's show. Thank you. This episode talks about true crime and murder. So if you are sensitive to this subject and are easily triggered, please, I ask that you do not watch this episode or listen to it and uh, stick around for next week's episode. Thank you so much. Hi. So, cafecito, but without the pandulita, of course. Um, for anyone that's listening on Spotify, I'm drinking some coffee right now, and my cup says cafecito y pan dulce, um, but I don't have any pan dulce right now, just the coffee. Gotta get that energy. <sighs> wow. This is episode 20. I can't believe it. I mean, I can because <laughs> I've I've been uh, keeping track of them, but you know, it feels good to make it to episode 20. Um, oh man, what can I say? Thank you to everyone who has been supporting this page, who's been listening and been watching. Honestly, it really means a lot to me and I appreciate it. Um, a lot of hard work goes, you know, into uh, making this podcast every week. And um, I know it's a small podcast, but nonetheless, it's my way of um, of relaxing, um, doing something that I enjoy and sharing that joy with other people. So hopefully you've all been enjoying this. Um, it's March now and it's the start of spring break. So I'm pretty sure, you know, if you are listening to this, um, episode, you have started your your spring break and I'm hoping you're enjoying it so far. Um, hopefully you are listening to this podcast while, you know, doing your spring break activities or if you're driving to spring break somewhere, listen to this podcast. Trust me. Oh man. Uh, spring break. I remember like in elementary I don't know about anyone else's school, but I do remember in my school, um, at least for sure, I can remember like one year, they gave out these uh, flyers to the parents, or I mean, they gave it to the students that we could give to our parents. And on the flyer, it's at like hazard to spring break, you know, what to look out for, you know, what to be careful with. Um, not that we had a lot of elementary kids doing spring break activities, but I suppose it was more of a, you know, be aware of your surroundings kind of thing, Um, which leads us to this week's episode. So if you have seen by the title, this is a true crime special. Um, I got a lot of good feedback on the previous true crime episode. And honestly, I have been wanting to do this true crime episode for some time. Um, Why? (sighs) Because it kind of deals with a supernatural. Oh man, I, I I won't get into it just yet, but geez, like it it's a good episode. Trust me. Um, a lot of time went into reading about this and you know putting this together for you guys. So back when I was a kid, um, like I said, I remember getting these these flyers from school saying, "Hey, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Uh, be mindful of who is next to you. Where if you go to to Matamoros." If you are from Brownsville, then you're aware that Matamoros is just like right across the border. Um, if you're locally in the RGB area, you know about Matamoros, you know about Progreso, Reynosa. Those are just our like, you know, our sister cities uh, right over the border. And Matamoros just happens to be Brownsville's, you know, sister city. Um, I did go to Matamoros, not often, but I did go with my family as a kid. Um, I haven't gone in years. Honestly, it's been at least maybe 15, maybe 18 years that I've gone to Matamoros. Ah, man. Um, I mean, things have changed so much. So, um, we've there, there's been an increase in crime and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe it was, it was just like that as when I was a kid, but maybe I wasn't just aware of it. You know, now as an adult, I'm very much aware of what's happening in Matamoros and, um, I mean, some people might find it super safe and no issues, but to me, I'm just not comfortable crossing um, 
mostly I mean my Spanish is is you know it's decent but um maybe it's decent in a conversation but not not so much so and I feel that you know if I were to get in any kind of danger I would just wouldn't know how to communicate with other people so this is probably one of the reasons why I don't cross and also I mean I don't really have business in Matamoros I don't have family that's there um you know the taco was supposed I mean man I admit going for the tacos was totally worth it but you know you can forego the tacos for some safety I mean in, in my opinion but yeah I remember as a kid we'd get those 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 flyers and one of the flyers I remember or talking to my mom about it was um she told me years ago a kid crossed into Matamoros and didn't come back and I was like what do you mean he didn't come back so she said that you know this young man crossed and he was kidnapped by the cartel or uh yeah i guess you could call them, yeah by some 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 people and they they uh tortured him and ended up killing him um so this brings us to the true crime of the murder of mark kilroy so if you are if you know who mark kilroy is awesome i'm glad you do um i feel like it's something that we need to talk about now, the reason I picked this, and you're probably thinking, wait, wait, what does this have to do with anything? Okay, well, we're, we're going there. So, Mark Hilroy crossed into Matamoros. And like I said, it's a sister city of Bronzeville. And it's important because the the the, the local inf- law enforcement of Bronzeville got involved. And this kid stayed at South Padre Island. So, I mean, it, it, it ties, it, it all ties in. And I say it's the supernatural because the people who kidnapped him, tortured him in order to gain gain uh air quotes here guys gain superpowers and be covered by this guy's blood in order to you know cross um drugs into the united states so this is where the supernatural comes in you know is it really supernatural Mm, not really but for someone who believes and like i said the power of belief is so strong you know with people um, if you believe in que te va a curar el huevo, te va a curar. If you if you believe that the egg is going to cure you, you know when they they you know pray over you with pray over it with you or pray over you with it, yeah, then you're gonna get cured. So these these people, they they believed in a form of uh, santeria, and um and and. And I bring this up because, you know, in previous episodes, I have discussed Santeria before and I have discussed Brujeria and um, how, how it's all tied in with, you know, with everything. And it, it's something to think about. So what they believed in was called Palo uh, Mayambe. Okay. Uh, Palo Mayambe is a religion or it's a form. It diverges from Santeria. And like I said, it, it's, it, it's a little darker um more ritualistic you could say uh and it, it it it's usually done in cuba you know in haiti areas like that so the reason i i bring it up is because this the the man who killed uh mark hillroy his name is adolfo constanzo and he believed that he was a um i guess you could say like a I'm not sure if you could say it's a god, but uh, like a like a high priest of the Palo Mayambe, you know, um, religion, and it was something that he practiced and like he preached it and he talked to everyone around him and he's like, "Yo, I can do this. I, you know, I can cure you of you know X, Y, and Z." And I mean, people believed him. You know, he had a strong following. Um he was a drug dealer he was a cult leader infamous in trafficking um he believed in the occult and he did his stuff in matamoros tamalipas you know um matamoros tamalipas mexico for anyone who's not local um and he was dubbed the the or his 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 occult gang was dubbed the narco satanists okay narco satanicos 
Um, his cult members nicked him the Godfather, El Padrino. Uh, Gonzalo led the cult with Sara Aldrete, who they nicknamed, you know, the Godmother, La Madrina. The cult was involved in multiple ritualistic killings through, in Mexico, in Matamoros. And, you know, most, they, they were brought down because of Mark Kilroy. So let's get into Mark Kilroy. Who is he? Okay. So Mark Kilroy was a student here in Texas. He was studying at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I mean, if you if you look at his picture, sweet looking kid, you know, you could tell that he's an all around, you know, all American boy, um, had so much going for him, so much potential. And it was just cut short. Um, sorry we hear some snorts. My pug is outside and she wants me to, you know, give her my attention and she has to wait. So if you hear some snorts, maybe some barking, um, that's my pug. Um, yeah, so, uh, Mark, he traveled to, okay, and, and the reason I bring it up right now is because it kind of coincides with his, uh, um, death day. So it's spring break time. And like any good person in spring break, you know, you want to take time away from school. You want to relax. And he was at that age where he wanted to go and live it up a little bit. So we're going to, we're going to travel back in time to March of 1989. So Mark grew up in Santa Fe, Texas, and he excelled in academics as well as in athletics. He actually had gotten a uh what you call it? a scholarship to play um i believe it was basketball at one of the universities and he played there i think for some time and then transferred to another university and then said you know what guys i'm gonna give all of my i'm gonna give up my athletics and go study at ut austin and do the pre-med program so that's what happened he you know decided to leave all that behind and you know do pre-med um as a kid he was in the boy scouts and he was also an honor student. He graduated 14th in his class out of 210. Pretty impressive, you know. That takes a lot of hard work to to get to that. So he went to Austin for UT Austin for pre med, and um, he was enjoying himself. He uh, I guess he calls up some of his friends and he's like, "Hey guys, you know, let's hang out together. Um, you know, let's go do our things. I'm gonna get prepared for my for my MCATs." So let's, let's just all hang out. Let's, you know, travel to, to Padre. Um, let's go to South Florida Island and, you know, just, just chill. So they did. Spring break comes, they pick each other up and they drive down to South Padre Island. They rent a room. They were having a good time. But Matamoros was a big scene for spring break during that time. And it, and it pretty much always has been, um, you know, chip, chip, cheap alcohol, you know, easy to cross, just right down, you know, from Brownsville. Most bars um, are just down the strip, you know, right by the by the bridge. And why? They're put there strategically because they're like, ah, vamos a ver la gente. You know, we're going to get the people to cross over easily so they don't get lost in the city. Boom, put them right here, you know, fill them up with some cheap liquor. And, you know, the drinking age is like, you know, I think maybe 18 over there, sometimes non-existent. So they cross over, have a good time, and they cross back, you know? And plus the tacos. Like I said, you you can't drink a taco. I think this is this is pre-Starbucks being everywhere. I think now people would just cross for the Starbucks, right? No, I'm just kidding. You don't cross for Starbucks for that. Starbucks is far too expensive. But anyways, so they cross over. And, um, I think it was him and three other guys, they go, they go, they're starting to have a good time. And like I said, you know, Matamoros was a popular party destination. And while they're there, they're, uh, you know, getting a little drunk and Mark separates from his friends for a little bit. And he's like, guys, I'm just going to go and have, a, I, I met this girl. I, I want to go talk to her. So he's talking to her. He's, uh, you know, engaging with her. And and the friends are like, hey, no problem. Mark, go, go for it. Um, so, yeah, Mark goes to um, Matamoros and 
he's having a good time talking to this girl and he's like um his friend his friends are understanding they they know they don't want to um you know ruin his, his his good time and mark's pretty responsible like i said this guy's in pre-med um for you to get that far um you have to be responsible you you just don't go and go to med school and i mean i mean i take the back there there's some doctors that i know of that probably um you can tell they, they party hard <sighs> maybe not a good thing who knows who knows not here judging slightly judging but not really okay so they um they had a good time in in, in um that that night I, okay so i'm gonna backtrack a little bit so yeah they they did south Padre island they had a good time i think they crossed into matamoros one night they had a good time they left they came back and the second night I think when they came back that's when they um you know this all starts happening so mark um meets the girl and starts talking to her and you know the friends you know they're like okay no problem no issue you know they had fun um they go to the bar um and it, eventually mark comes back to the friends and he's like uh guys you know it's getting late let's vamos a cruzar atrás. let's go back well, probably didn't say in Spanish, but yeah, he, he tells his friends, let's go back, man. Um, so they, they say, okay, no problem. Let's, let's, let's go. Um, and so Mark starts, you know, uh, walking and, you know, he, it, because on, on different reports, um, I read a couple of like things there. So one of them was that he continued to go with the girl or like they, they were, he was still with that girl talking with her. As he walked away with his friends, another report, um, he, uh, walked away with his friends and then saw the girl again. Okay. So they start heading back to, to, uh, or they, they decide to head back to the island around 2 a.m. Okay. And this is a uh, local time, central time. Um, his friends stopped out. They, they got out of the, the, the bar and they saw him talking to, you know, the girl, um, and, there was a lot of people that were leaving the bars already because, you know, at that, you know, usually closing time in, in bars is around 2 a.m. Um, the model swim, probably not that, not dif that different. Um, like I said, I've never done spring break, so I'm not too aware what the, you know, how the party goes there. But I'm assuming around 2 a.m. they start closing everything up and they're like, okay, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here kind of thing. Um, you know, so him and his friends are walking and um the four of them were walking together but there was just so much, so much you know like foot traffic that they end up you know splitting and two and two they were walking two and two so uh near near uh um well if you're local you know that there's a place called garcias um and you know these guys stopped in there or stopped close to there to garcias um and one of the friends was like, guys, I need to go pee. The other two walked up ahead. Mark stayed behind. And uh, he's like, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, uh, just, you know, wait until you're finished, you know, peeing. And he was saying goodbye to that woman that he had been talking to. So he's waiting for his friend to come, come back from peeing. And um, when his friend came back around the corner of Garcia's, he's like, my man left me. My boy left me. What the hell? My boy's gone. So he was like, ah, eh, he probably went up ahead, you know, probably got tired of me, you know, peeing or whatever and walked up ahead. So he starts walking up ahead too and starts heading towards, you know, the bridge and eventually crosses back or they get towards the bridge and the friends are like, hey, where's Mark? And the dude's like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know what, what happened to him. So they said maybe he crossed and we just didn't see him he passes and he's already in brownsville he's waiting by the car so they said let's cross into brownsville so they did they crossed into brownsville and no mark wasn't by the car they waited for a few minutes and they said okay well let's go back to matamoros let's go see what's happening maybe he is over there maybe he was still talking to that girl and we just you know overlooked him so they crossed back into matamoros and they searched for him up until about like 4 30 in the morning and at that time 
the streets were empty so they should have seen him you know <sighs> nothing so they say okay you know what maybe he caught a ride with someone back to the hotel and he's been at this hotel this entire time and we're looking for him here about the motos and he knows that so they headed back to the island and they get to the hotel and he's not there they all knocked out you know they were tired they were drinking they were drunk you know the next day they wake up and mark is still not around so the friends kind of like whoa bro what do we do so naturally they said um maybe we should contact the police because you know we're not from here um maybe he was in a car accident or something maybe something happened to him and he might be in the hospital right so the friends call um the the police and you know they let him know hey uh, our friend, he, he's, uh, we're, we're not from here. We're from, you know, such and such place. You know, he, he's, he studies in Austin, but he's from Santa Fe, Texas. And we're here for spring break at the South Padre Island. And, um, we crossed into Mapa Motos last night and we crossed back and we haven't seen him since about two in the morning. You know, the police were like, oh, he's probably just drunk somewhere in about the motos probably got arrested. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll call around. You guys can call around too. The police kind of just, you know, brushed it off, right? So they went back to Matamoros and they were trying to contact the authorities over there and were saying, hey, um, something happened. We cannot find our friend, you know. And so, the again, the authorities are like, no, no pasa nada. He's probably just in one of the hospitals. He's probably just drunk in a jail cell. And, you know, they're they're trying to, you know, assure the guys that nothing's wrong. Nothing happens, you know. But again, you got to remember, money talks you know so when you have a big event like spring break and someone goes missing um you want to kind of like sweep that under the rug you don't want that to be the talk of the town because who's gonna want to party at your place if people are missing left and right i mean i wouldn't i i i probably wouldn't um you know so they're trying to say, guys, you know, don't make a big deal out of it. Nothing's going on. So eventually they come back to the United States and said, hey, we can't find him. They call the, um, they, they call Mark's family. The, um, one of his friends is like, you know, it's time to call his mom and let him, let her know that we can't find Mark. So they call his mom and they said, hey, this is what's going on. We can't find Mark. So his mom's like, I knew something was wrong. Okay. So they contact his uh, uncle, who happens to be a Border Patrol agent in Los Angeles, okay? And his uncle's like, we'll, we'll figure something out. We're going to do something. So he starts calling, you know, the areas here and saying, hey, we need to have something, hap you know, looked at because my nephew is missing. And um, he crossed into Matamoros and now he's just gone. So, of course, you know, you have a, 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 an agency trying to dictate over here. And they're saying, hey, we're going to make a big, you know, fuss about it. And we're going to blow up your spring break if you don't check it out. So, boom. Man, people started searching. They created a task force. We're going to find Mark, you know. And, of course, they notify Matamoros. And everyone in Matamoros is like, I know, senor. No, 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 no. We're going to look for Mark también. So, now it's the U.S. and the Mexican authorities looking for Mark. You know, so they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what happened to him. Okay. I mean, at this point, man, you know, just, just knowing these, these things that he just went missing, you know, is enough to just put me off of the idea of going to spring break or even partying. Um, you know, time, like I said, times have changed a lot. Um, I remember as a kid thinking, oh man, I, I, I I'm so, you know, um, and in, not insecure, but you know, going to Target is, you know, can be a, a, such a danger. You never know when someone's going to mug you. Or, I mean, not necessarily mug you, but attack you and, and you know, take you into their car. It was not something that, you know, you thought of then. Now, that's a concern. That's a general concern. Yeah, like going to the store, you know, like um, Target or Walmart, H-E-B, and you're putting your stuff in your groceries and in your per in your purse, in your, bat, in your back seat, in your trunk, wherever you're putting them. You know, it, it could be a concern that, hey, you never know when someone's going to, like, assault you from behind and just put you in a car. Um, I've, I've seen, like, these posts on the Facebook that say, um, if you see a note on your door, you know, don't don't move it, you know, because it's it's the newest way of attacking women. And, 
if you see a water bottle like this, don't move it, you know, just leave it there. And, you know, it's genuinely scary. You never know when something like that's going to happen. Someone's going to try to take you. Um, it's not something that I, I, I don't remember thinking, you know, about 20 years ago. If I go to Walmart, someone's going to put me in the car. I mean, yeah, I and mean, there was always talk like, hey, you know, be careful, be aware of your surroundings. It, it's always something that you have talked about. But I think now it's more, you know, out of the open that things like this do happen. And it's kind of scary to think, hey, this guy went to party with his friends, you know, something that he's, you know, that kids do all the time. They've doing it, been doing it for years. And he goes missing. It's creepy. It's scary. So, yeah, this happens to Mark. Um, his family's looking for him. At this t- at this point, you know, both Mexican and U.S. authorities suspect that um, something, something could... Because, I mean, what ends up happening is they call the local hospitals. They call the local, you know, jail. They're looking around. Um, the, he's not at the local hotels. Um, no one has seen him. No one in the, that matches his description has been found. So they're starting to think something happened, you know, um, you know, maybe something along the lines that maybe he got kidnapped and he's been hurt. So they're suspecting that, yeah, foul play is involved. They speculate that Kilroy could have been a victim of a drug related violence or of a robbery killing, but they were short on leads. You know, who, what, what are they going to do? You know, they, I guess CCTV wasn't as prevalent back in 89, you know, and I, I don't blame them, you know. Things back then were very different from what they are now. So when they reported his his disappearance, um, the customs agents went with them to Mata Moros to help retrace their steps. And, you know, the Texan officials contacted the U.S. Uh, consulate in Mata Moros and asked for investigators to carry out a search with the Kiro's description in the Mata Moros jails and hospitals. Investigators then hired a hypnotist to see if they could figure out some, if, if, they, could, if they could pinpoint like, oh, I have like a missing memory. You know, now, um, from someone who has a degree in psychology, I'll I'm be honest with you, doing that's complete bullshit. <laughs> um, it's like when they say, I'm going to give you a, a lie detector test. That's bullshit. You know, you don't detect lies with that. All you detect is changes in, you know, uh, respiration and um, heart rate, which you can, if you are trained, you can like keep that, you know, under control. Um, but it's the idea of thinking, oh, it's a lie detector test. It, you get false positive, false negatives with that. You know, it, it does nothing. It doesn't actually tell you if you're lying or not. Um, same thing with, you know, hypnotism. Often it has been said that people implant false memories, you know, when they, when they're doing that. Um, what happens is they put you to sleep and they're asking you, um, now think back. Do you remember seeing someone? Wearing a black shirt. Yes. I see someone wearing a black shirt. Yes. They were by the door. You know, you, you start implanting things like that. False memories. And um, it's just not very valid. Honestly, it really isn't. Um, That I know of, it doesn't really hold up in court like it did at one point. Not that it, I don't think it actually really did, to be honest with you. Um, But yeah, just throwing that out there Um, from what I've known from school. That's something that. Yeah, just just don't be careful with with hypnotism. So, anyways, let's see where was I? Okay, um, so under the hypnosis, his friend um stated that he saw a young Hispanic man wearing a blue plaid shirt, and um was visible in with a scar across his face, and he was talking to Kilroy before he disappeared. You know, again, sorry about my pug; she's still out there. She's wanting to you know, get some cuddles. He recalled that the man walked up to Kilroy and told him, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? And though um, his friend Huddleston said he was not sure if Kilroy responded back, he didn't remember him seeing him. However, none of the friends were able to pay, able to precisely recall the exact moment or place where Kilroy disappeared. Investigators seduced that by this story that Kilroy was kidnapped for robbery or ransom. The first option seemed that most likely because his abductors had not called for a payment. So they're thinking, oh, they just robbed him. Robbery gone, gone wrong. Okay. They believe that Kirill's body was probably dumped in a remote location. So they said, okay, let's, we're going to send the helicopters out to look. 
Helicopters and terrain vehicles of the United States Border Patrol were called to look for the Rio Grande River, but his body was not found. Okay. <sighs> Where they found his body, guys, like, if you are sensitive to this material, um, I ask you to turn this off now. Um, if you want to keep going, great. Push through with me, trust me. Um, at the end, this this is worth listening to. So during the investigation, Carol's parents headed to the Rio Grande Valley. So remember, they were in Santa Fe, Texas. They live over there. Now they're heading back to they're heading to Brownsville to to this area because they need to find their son. And um, they were handing out twenty thousand handouts throughout the region that offered a fifteen thousand dollar reward to anyone who could help locate Mark. They met with the Attorney General Jim Jim Maddox, the Texas Governor William Clements, and a U.S. Senator to assist them on this case. Texan officials told Kilroy's parents that they were planning to talk to the Tamaulipas Governor Américo Villarreal Guerrera and get people from Matamoros more involved in their son's disappearance. You know, the more people that look, the better. Better chance of finding this guy, right? You know, or at least finding his body. <sighs> It's one of those things that sometimes, you know, it's just, mm -mm. So people from Carroll's hometown traveled to Matamoros and issued flyers offering a reward to anyone who could provide information on his safe return. The U.S. authorities had praised the efforts of the Mexican federal police on the case, but they dis distrusted the state and municipal office officials. They suspected that because state and local authorities were acting slowly and not sharing enough information that Carroll's murderers had insiders within their ranks you're gonna find dirty cops anywhere whether it's in the u.s side mexican side you know any side you're you're gonna find dirty cops you know it's with anyone honestly it's not just cops any dirty officials they're in the u.s too trust me if you put a google search in dirty officials you're gonna find some shit trust me i've seen it so, um, on March 26th, the case was highlighted on national television in the crime show America's Most Wanted. This gave the case na nationwide attention and generated several phone calls and letters with people giving clues on Carol's whereabouts. However, the police said that none of these leads generated were solid enough to pursue. A few days later, Kilroy's parents returned to Santa Fe. Santa Fe residents raised money enough to through garage sales and car washes to help Kibler's family continue their search. In addition, Kibler's parents went to the University of Texas at Austin to withdraw their son from school. Okay. So they have a feeling that their son's dead. You know, he went missing on March 14th and it's March 26th and, you know, he's not showing up. So if he's not there, then something's wrong, right? Don't know we don't know, but we know. Um, on April 1st, 1989, Mexican federal federales manning a drug in interdict... I am so sorry. What did I write here? Interdiction checkpoint saw a vehicle run the roadblock without stopping. <sighs> Guys, if you see a roadblock, it's there for a reason, okay? Just stop. You know, especially if you have, like, some drugs on you. Because, I mean, they're going to find you. You're not invisible. The vehicle had crossed the international border from Texas and sped through Mexican Federal Highway Number 2, which connects Matamoros and Reynosa, Tamaulipas. Instead of turning on their police sirens and stopping the truck, the police decided to follow it using an unmarked vehicle. The checkpoint runner then traveled out to the Santa, Santa Elena Ranch outside Matamoros, the police pulled it off, pulled off at a distance to observe. After about 30 minutes, the driver of the truck took off from the ranch and headed back to the city. The officers decided to make their move on the ranch. In a quick search, the police discovered cult paraphernalia and marijuana traces. Man, whoo! You, when you talk cult, shit, shit's getting real. In uh, I think it's my freshman year. In college, um, I took a class, or I think it was a uh, sociology. The cults that we talked about, damn. Probably one of my favorite things to talk about. No joke, but it's it's scary. 
you know, the mindset of these people, you know, I mean, I'm not saying they're brainwashed, but they're brainwashed. Um, so if you have been a victim of a cult, I am so sorry. Um, you know, man, it, they're, cults are real guys. So police determined that the driver, um, of the truck was Serafina Hernandez Garcia, the nephew of local drug lord whose operations were based around the ranch area. But instead of arresting Hernandez Garcia, the police decided to continue gathering more evidence on the suspected criminal activities at the ranch and the organized crime members involved with the Hernandez family. They used inform informants in Matamoros to inquire on family, quote unquote, guys, family activities at Santa Elena in order to make a series of crucial arrests. On April 9th, they returned with several other policemen and arrested Hernandez Garcia, his uncle Elio Hernandez Rivera, cult members David Serna Valdez and Sergio Martinez Salinas and Domingo Reyes Bustamante, the ranch's caretaker. While in custody, the detainees were, were very relaxed, they were super chill. I mean, they were described as being so calm that, you know, one of them was like, can I have a smoke and just, you know, no stress, no worries. They were like, guys, this is nothing, okay? Either they seen some shit or they've got something up their sleeve, right? Um, so they, the police interrogated another caretaker at the ranch and this person revealed to the police that the ranch had frequent visitors from Serafine's criminal group. The ranch's caretaker identified Kilroy through a photograph. He's like, hey, conozco a ese muchacho. Lo vi. Woo. Yeah, the caretaker told the, the police, I saw him, and then pointed at the shack, to the shack at the ranch, right? When the police interrogated Hernandez Garcia separately, he confessed that several people, including Kilroy, had been killed over the course of several months at Santa Elena. So there it is. Kilroy is dead. And you're probably thinking, wow, what a buildup. No, it gets better, okay? So Hernandez Garcia said that the slayings had been ordered by Adolfo Constanzo, a cult leader who practiced a ritual form of human sacrifice in the belief that it provided supernatural protection for the drug gang. So this is where the supernatural comes in, guys. Does Palo Mayombe really protect you? I don't know. I, I don't believe in it to say that, yeah, it protects you. But maybe to this guy, it did. Shit. Who knows? Um, Constanza believed that the that Constanza believed that by sacrificing his victims, those doing the sacrifice were ensured strength, abundance, and immunity from law enforcement and injury. Okay, so they, like I said, he believed that you know if I, you know, do this, I am bathed in you know I'm cloaked in the blood of my enemies. Um, no one can see me. I'm untouchable. You know. So that could be why these people were so chill and were like, you know, what, the police? Whatever. No biggie. Mm. According to, um, okay, here I am. Sorry, guys. Lost my, my point of, of, uh, reading here. So, yeah. So he believed that, that they would protect him, right? So Hernandez Garcia said that Constanzo had ordered his men to find a white Anglo ma man a good goal to sacrifice, okay? That was their, their mission. According to Serafina Hernandez Garcia, he and other members of the gang had mingled with the spring break students in Matamoros on the night of March 14th. As Kilroy stood on the street near his friends, one of the men turned to him, um, turned to him close to a truck. As Kilroy approached the vehicle, Hernandez Garcia and another cult member, Malio Fabio Ponce Torres, grab Kilroy and wrestle him inside the truck. When one of the gangsters stopped for a few moments to catch his breath two blocks along the road, Kilroy broke loose and ran. So, like I said, um, he had said, yeah, his, his, his belief was, okay, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, go find me a white guy. And they do. And that's when they run into him and they say, you know, we found him on the middle of the street and we're like, hey, bro, we get in the car. He doesn't want to get in the car. I mean, I wouldn't either. Random car. 
two something in the morning to let me get in, I wouldn't do it. I mean, hell, I think I would be kicking and screaming, you know, loudly. I mean, the I, I, I wonder, you know, from what I had read, there were so many people on the street, you know, trying to get back to, to, but are they so drunk that they don't hear what's going on? I don't know. I don't do spring break. You know, this is probably one of the reasons why I don't do spring break. Um, but yeah, so he, Kilroy, you know, he's fighting back or he's trying to fight back and they had wrestled him into the truck. Um, one of the gangsters, you know, stopped for a few minutes to catch his breath and Kilroy broke loose, ran, but was intercepted by another vehicle driven by the gangsters allies who took him prisoner at gunpoint. They're like, get in now or you die right here. He was then subdued and handcuffed to the back of the second car, okay? The gangsters drove Kilroy through the back streets of the city and past the industrial area, passing through the city's outskirts to Santa Elena Ranch. The men left Kilroy inside the car overnight. Shortly after dawn, the ranch's caretaker went to see Kilroy and fed him bread, eggs, and water. I mean, the fact that they fed him, wow. I mean, they have some kind of, you know, um, no, no, they don't. I mean, why would they feed him? If they, if they know they're going to kill him, why would they feed him? You know, it gives a guy hope for, you know, for nothing. Um, about 12 hours later, um, after Kimber was kidnapped, Gonzalez and his men came to see him. They wrapped his face and mouth with duct tape and walked him through a field to a storage cabin with his hands still tied around his back. Throughout the night of the 15th, Constanza tortured and sodomized Kilroy. He was then led out to the field where Constanza killed him by chopping the back of his neck and head with a machete. His brain was then boiled in a ganganya, an African metal pot that an African metal pot that Constanza used to stew human and animal remains. Oh, oh my god, I can just picturing that like makes my stomach turn, you know. Um it, when you're cooking food, okay, you know, you you know you're gonna cook it, you're gonna eat it, you're gonna consume it. But can you imagine um what he's put in there? Um from what I had heard, um it it reeked that it smelled putrid. Um If I must have pronounced that wrong, I'll be honest with you. The gun 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 ga Um I I thought I had written down how to pronounce it, but I guess I didn't. Um let me just Google real quick how to pronounce it. I'm be honest with you, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> We're gonna call it the cauldron, okay? You're probably thinking, eh. That's what it is. It's a cauldron. Um, and it's a cauldron full of human remains and just animal remains. Oh my gosh. Yeah. From what I read, it reeked like it, it's not putrid. And, um, I don't know if you ever heard of the, the corpse flower. There are flowers that actually smell of rotting flesh, um, that they use to attract flies and beetles to pollinate them. And it's just, most of them are, or some of them are found in, in the Amazon rainforest, but, um, some of them are grown in greenhouses and they say that the smell is so strong that it will make you vomit. And I've never smelled one. Um, but one time I was at work and there was a dead rat in the ceiling in like the air vent or something. And it smelled so bad. So I, I assume it smells just as bad as that. You know, it says a corpse flower versus a dead rat. Um, it's nasty. Anyway, back to this. So yeah, in his big cauldron, his big, you know, pot, he was stewing animal remains and human remains. So Kimberly's legs were chopped off above his knees to facilitate his burial. Um, man, they boiled his brain. Wow. Just the fact knowing that there's boiled human brain in this big pot. It's, mm, it's, it's unsettling. 
So his legs were chopped off to make it easier. A wire was inserted in his spinal column so that once that the body had decomposed, the bones could be pulled up from the soil easily. The cult members then dug a hole on the ground and buried Kevin's corpse. Hernandez Garcia agreed to take the police to the spot where Kevin was buried, which just marked the ends of the wire coming out of the dirt. Hernandez Garcia explained the function of the wire. Once they retrieved the bones, cult members would wear them as necklaces to ward off danger and injury. A life for a life, basically. You know, I kill him so I can be protected. You know, and it, it sort of reminds me of that part. If you've seen, if you haven't seen that that the that Avengers movie with Thanos, where he does and then everyone disappears, go watch it. If you haven't seen it, I just spoiled it for you. Sorry, you should have watched it a long time ago. Um, so yeah, like it kind of reminds me of that I I know there's a section where he's like, he has to give up someone that he loves in order to get the the last stone that he needed. Um. And so basically that's what it is. Like, okay, you give me this, you give me protection. I gave you this body. I gave you this man's life. And because of his life, I wear his his bones on me and fashion baby. Just know. So on April eleventh, the police took it on this. Uh uh. Yeah. They took him back to the they they went back to some Santa Lena Ranch, okay? Um, and they forced him, and they forced him at gunpoint to spend several hours digging up the graves, because they had more than one grave. They had been killing a lot of people. Once Kilroy's corpse had been exhumed, the police observed that his legs were missing. Said Afina explained that the amputations were not a procedure of the ritual, but were done to simplify the burial. When the excavation was concluded, the suspects had unearthed 15 mutilated bodies, including Kilroy's. All males had been killed over a period of nine months. Kilroy's corpse was officially identified after the bronze police matched his dental records with the teeth found at the scene. Investigators concluded that most of the victims were rival drug dealers of Constanzo and not random abductees like Kilroy. Three out of the 15 bodies were never identified. At Santa Elena, the Mexican police also seized 110 kilograms of marijuana, 108 grams of cocaine, 12 firearms, including three submachine guns and 11 vehicles, some equipped with telephones. Inside an iron pot, investigators discovered remains of human brain, a goat's head, chicken feet, a turtle, several herbs, a horseshoe, and coins mixed in with animal blood. They found no signs of cannibalism. Well, at least that, right? At least they didn't eat them. I mean... Oh, even even then, it's just no. It's it doesn't make it any better. The fact that they didn't eat them doesn't make it any better. Um, I mean, like I said, when you make something to eat, you know you're gonna consume it. You're gonna you're nourishing your body. It's one thing when you're just doing it just for fuck's sake. That's something else, and it's just it, it's wrong on on all levels. On April 12th, the detainees were taken to the headquarters of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police in Matamoros. Why did I say it like that? I guess I'm tired. In Matamoros for an informal press conference, more than 250 international journalists arrived at the scene to take pictures and ask them questions. The four suspects were paraded from the building's balcony and were allowed to answer questions from reporters. Elio Hernandez Rivera stated that he was an or or ordained executioner under Constanzo and that Constanzo himself had murdered Kilroy. As the camera zoomed in on the suspects, Hernandez Rivera showed his mership scars on his shoulders, back, arms, and chest. These were arrow-like cuts made with a hot blade. The marks were given to selected cult members with the authority to perform human sacrifice. So let's get into a little bit on um, should we We'll get back to him. Okay, we'll get back to. We're going to talk a bit about the murderer, but you know, we'll get back to him right now in a second. Um. So let's see. On April thirteenth, the religious ceremony initially intended to revive hope for Kilroy's safe return, turned to a memorial service a day after his body was discovered. So his his family had hope. You know, the whole community where he grew up in had hope because he was a good boy. He was a good man. He was a good person, and you know, his life was just cut short. 
by some crazy psycho who believed that, you know, if he killed a a good person, a clean person, that he was going to be protected for life. And just ridiculous. The service was held at Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church in Santa Fe. Many local residents attended the service and about 150 children pinned yellow ribbons outside the church's trees to rally in favor of Kilroy. After the ceremony, Kilroy's friends said they wish they had stayed in Texas to party instead of going to Mexico. At St. Luke Catholic Church in Brownsville, over 1,200 people attended memorial service to support Kilroy's parents. Several of the attendees wore, wore yellow ribbons with Miss You Mark written on them and waited in line after the service was over to express their condolences to Kilroy's parents. The Kilroy family showed deep faith and conviction while speaking to the press. Kilroy's father spoke about the murder and told the press that they were not angry with the killers. He hoped that if, when the, when, if and when those were responsible for Kilroy's death, go to heaven and see their son, they can apologize to him for the wrongdoing. Kilroy's mother told others to pray for the murderers. Man, that takes a lot. It takes a big person to not necessarily forgive your, your son's murderer, but to say, pray for them. Um, man, if I were his mom, I don't think I'd be able to say that. I don't think... If I were his dad, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to say that either. I mean, to think, oh, they're going to one day see my son again and I want them to apologize. Like, wow. You know, they're, they're, they have a very strong faith in order to, to believe that and just think, you know, we're not the ones responsible for, you know, what happens to them, but someone else is. Like, like I said, this all ties in. It all ties in. So, two weeks after the bodies were exhumed from Santa Elena, the Mexican Federal Police returned to the ranch early in the morning to burn down the shack and lay a wooden cross above the ashes. Reportedly, the police took a curandero, a full killer, to purify the shack before burning it down. The curandero went inside the house, said a few prayers, sprinkled the floor with salt, and conducted, and concluded by making the sign of the cross. The policemen then proceeded to spray gasoline around the shack before setting it on fire. The Mexican government offered no official explanation for their actions, but a source close to the investigation stated that the police's motives were supernatural in nature. Like I said, you know, people, when you have a strong belief in something, um, and especially this person had a strong belief in this this ideal that, you know, by worshiping um, these demons or these, these, uh, these, I mean, I don't want to say the word demon because they're not necessarily demons that he's worshiping, but you're worshiping something dark that there's going to be a dark, you know, vibe in that area. Um, you, you, your aura, you know, um, does have a color. And, you know, you if there's an aura around that area that's black and dark and, you know, dingy, you're going to feel it. You know, that's like when sometimes you go to a place, you, you get that negative vibe, you can feel, get a weird vibe. It, it's because of that, you know, vibes stay in certain places. So they, they set on fire for that reason, you know. Um, they said that the that they knew the shack meant a lot to Constanzo and burning it would make would make him go insane. We would hit him where it hurts, the police said. The next morning, Constanzo reportedly went into a rage after the arson was shown on national television. I mean, I would too. You worked so hard for that and then someone goes and burns it? Good riddance, man. They should have burned it twice, you know. One for one to get rid of the spirits and one just for show. Because that dude. No. Dude's crazy. So let me just, you know, give you a brief on who Consta who this guy is, okay? So Constanza was born in Miami, Florida to Delia Aurora Gonzalez, a Cuban immigrant mother in 1962. She gave birth to him at the age of 15 and eventually had three children by different fathers. Then moved to San Juan, Puerto Rico after her first husband died and remarried there. Constanza was baptized Catholic and served as an altar boy, but also accompanied his mother on trips to Haiti to learn about voodoo. Constanza's family returned to Miami in 1972 and his stepfather died soon after leaving the family with some money. As a teenager, he became a pre apprentice to a 
local sorcerer and began to practice a religion called Palo Mayombe, which involves animal, animal sacrifice. Delia remarried and his new stepfather was involved in both the religion and drug dealing. Glow and Sansa and his mother were arrested numerous times for theft, vandalism, and shoplifting. He graduated from high school but was expelled from prep school. As an adult, Gonzalez moved to, New- to moved to Mexico City and met the men who were to become his followers, Martin Quintana, Jorge Montes, and Omar Orea. They began to run a profitable business casting spells to bring good luck, which involved expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, go- goats, snakes, zebras, and even lion cubs. Many of his clients were rich drug dealers and hitmen who enjoyed the violence of Constanza's magical displays. He also attracted other rich members of Mexican society, including several high-ranking corrupt policemen who introduced him to the city's powerful drug cartels. His cult was so- said to be associated with the notable Gulf Cartel. Ooh, the Gulf Cartel. If you know who they are, um, good. If you don't, um, I'll give you the little brief explanation. Gulf Cartel is one of the big cartels in Mexico. Um, them and something else. Don't know who the other one is. Um, they're usually called Cartel del Golfo. It's a criminal syndicate and drug trafficking organization in Mexico, and perhaps one of the oldest ones um, in the country. It is currently based in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, directly across the U.S. border from Brownsville, Texas. Okay, that too, the Gulf Cartel is. Gonzalo started the to raid graveyards for human bodies to put in his in his gang, ganganga or cauldron. Ganganga. There you go. I said it finally. Uh, before long, his cult decided to that the spirits of the dead that resided in the ganganga would be stronger, providing the cult more powerful protection with live human sacrifices instead of old bones. Because I mean. They've been dead for a while, right? So, no, we need someone fresh. The resulting killing soon totaled more than 20 victims whose mutilated bodies were found in and around Mexico City. This process escalated until Gonzalo eventually decided that the gang needed the power of a brain from an American student, culminating with the 1989 murder of Mark Hilroy. So, Gonzalo began to believe that his magic, many of which he took from Palo Mayombe, were responsible for the success of the cartels and demanded to become a full business partner with one of the most powerful families he knew, the Calzadas. So, okay, so not to get too, not to give him too much power here, but yeah, so he basically, you know, um, he got involved, he knew what he was doing when it came to his, his uh, magic, and he used it to his advantage to get ahead, okay? Um, he knew that he wanted to cross his his stuff into the US to the US, you know, and he's like, I can easily do it. Um, got involved with the with the big cartel, was you know, like no issue there. Um, so in nineteen eighty nine, Gonzalo moved to Rancho Santa Elena, a house in the desert. It is where he carried out more sadistic ritual murders, sometimes of strangers and other times of rival drug dealers. He also used the ranch to store huge shipments of cocaine and marijuana. On March 13, 1989, Gonzalo Hentman abducted pre-med student Mark Kilroy from outside a Mexican bar and took him to the ranch. Okay. So they they took him, they killed him, you know. In the process, they discovered, you know, 15 mutilated corpses were dug up at the ranch, and one of them was Kilroy's. And um, all these happened, like I told you, um, within the nine-month period. Uh, Gonzalo fled to Mexico City with four of his followers. They were only discovered when police were called to the apartment because of an unrelated dispute taking place there. As the officers approached, Gonzalo, mistakenly believing that he had located him, opened fire with a machine gun. This brought in police reinforcements, detained not to go to prison, determined not to go to prison. He handed the gun to his follower, Alvaro de Leon, and ordered him to open fire on him and Martin uh, Quintana. By the police reached the apartment, both Gonzalo and Quintana were dead. The little knew as El Dubi and Sara Aldra- Alder- Aldrete were immediately arrested. A total of 14 cult members were charged with a range of crimes from murder and drug running to obstructing the course of justice. Okay. I mean, was it would have been great if they could have caught him and like really just 
handed him the business because he deserved it. He really thought he was untouchable and he wasn't. He really wasn't. So, um, ultimately, you know, that's what happened with Mark. Um, you know, he got, went to party, um, went the wrong way, got caught by some people, ended up dying. A very horrible death, to say the least. Um, I feel bad for his family that, you know, they had to even discover that. But I'm glad they were able to have that kind of closure, at least. Um, just, the dude didn't deserve it. Um, anyways, two months after Kimura was confirmed dead, his parents founded the Mark Kimura Foundation, which promotes drug awareness, education, and prevention through the Just Say No campaign. Since Kimura's dream to was to become a doctor after college, his parents decided to help others and continue his dream through, his, through this program. Since 1984, since 1994, the foundation has sponsored and worked alongside substance abuse free environment safe, a nonprofit community group that promotes awareness for substance abuse and drug prevention. Both of them partner with Santa Fe local government, its school system, and the and the ones nearby. According to Carol's father, the purpose of these summer activities or the or these things were to um, keep the youth distracted when not in school to keep them out of you know drugs and stuff. Um, so some good came from that, you know, from his death. I mean, they were able, his parents were able to, to channel everything into something else. Um, yeah, it was Satanist group, you know, that killed him. And it's sad, you know, but hopefully um, some good can continue coming from this. If you like this to, to today's episode, um, then like and subscribe. If you did not, I'm sorry. We're going to go back to our regular programming next week. Um, you know, these true crimes are just something a little bit different to pop up and keep things fresh. Um, I really hope you do like them, though. It was a lot of fun researching this, even just by reading everything I read and seeing what I saw. Um, so like and subscribe. Like I said, follow us on calacaspod.com. We have um, all our the links to our social media there. If you're listening to this on YouTube, subscribe to Spotify, Spotify subscribe to youtube follow us on instagram and continue to like and share this page because it keeps this page alive thank you so much for listening and remember life begins after coffee thank you